Today's guest will share the inspiring story of a renowned multi-generational Stag's Leap District winery, how and where it started, what changes they've made over the years, and where it's heading. The winery was first recognized for its Cabernet Sauvignon at the Judgment of Paris in 1976. Currently the head of wine growing and the chairman of the board at Claude Duval, my guest today, Olaf Gallet, has his eye on the past, but with a focus on the future. Welcome to Uncorked, an insider's look at the wine industry from the lawyers of Ferrella, Braun, and Martel. I'm Catherine Filipakis, head of the firm's wine industry practice. Each episode, my colleagues and I bring you the latest insights from California's wine industry and beyond. We open a favorite bottle and settle in for a chat about all things grape to glass. From our offices in the Napa Valley and in San Francisco, we invite you to uncork a bottle and join us. Hi, I'm Rick Van Duzer. I'm a partner at Ferrella Bronner Martel. I'm a trial lawyer. I specialize in, among other things, the uh, the wine industry. And I'm excited to be here today on this episode of Uncorked with our guest today, Olaf Gallet of Clodeval Winery in the Stag's Leap area of Napa Valley. I think everybody probably knows that Clodeval was founded 50 years ago in 1972. It was one of the original wineries in the Stag's Leap district and obviously was one of the wineries that put Napa the Valley on the map in the 1976 Paris wine tasting. Welcome, Olaf. Rick, thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be a part of this podcast. Just a, a pleasure to chat a little bit about what we do here at Clodeval and to share a bit about our story and where we're going. Great. Well, one of the best parts about Uncorked is that what we do initially right at the beginning is open up a bottle of wine that our guest chooses and selects. And uh, Olaf, you've brought a, a new bottle, a new release from Clodeval with you. Why don't you tell us a little bit about it? So I chose to uncork uh, and share with you, Rick, a 2009. 19 yet to Lil, which is a Stag Sleep District red wine from our home here in Napa. This wine is new to our program, uh, but I think it's always been at the core of our, our philosophy of winemaking as a winery. Clodeval really came to life through a mutual connection and passion for winemaking, family history in Bordeaux. And to have a French winemaker who really came to Napa and, and drove a Bordeaux approach to winemaking was really what I think created the identity of Clodeval here in California. And this wine is just staying true to that, which is a, a Bordeaux varietal blend that is supposed to drive what we think is the complete terroir expression of our vineyard here in Stag's Leap. Like all Clodeval wines, I think it's a wine that shows you freshness in the glass, both on the nose and on the palate, really lifting up the fruit characteristics of the different varietals that are in the wine. Because of where we're located, we know that this wine will always be well supported by Cabernet Sauvignon. It's one thing that we love about the, the Stag's Leap terroir and, and, and environment is it, it lends itself well to a soft, elegant, and unassumed power from the Cabernet Sauvignon. And then Merlot that brings out freshness and, and some roundness and juiciness to the wine. Cabernet Franc, which uh, lifts up the elegance and the aromatics. And Malbec and Petit Verdot kind of rounding out the finishing for added structure and color and complexity. All right, let's take a sip. Ooh, that's wonderful. Tell us a little bit about the name, Yet a Lil. Where does that come from? So Yet a Lil is my grandmother's nickname. As a grandchild growing up, my siblings, cousins, and I, we used to always hear my grandfather and her close friends and, and, and relatives refer to her as Yet a Lil. Her name is Henrietta, and her mother was Danish, and that was really her nickname growing up, which is Little Yetta. Her mother was Henrietta, so she became Yetta and then Little Henrietta. So... You know, for us, it was an opportunity to, as we've been reflecting about the Claude of Owl story and who have been the the drivers or the the inspiration behind the 50 years of history that we now have here. There's always been a lot of talk about Bernard, and rightly so. He's really the sole keeper of our winery. And my grandfather is a bit of the visionary and I guess the man who pushed the pursuit to go try something new. But my family, we all know that the anchor behind the story has always been my grandmother. And she's always kept pushing us to think about those who come after us. So she's always been a big proponent of don't make any decision now. Let the people, the generation after you make a decision. And so we have the benefit 
as a third generation now owning this business, it's really because she has always pushed my grandfather to say, just let's, let's see what your grandkids want to do with it. And I don't know, it inspires us to think the same way. And so as we launch into a new decade with a new wine, it seemed fitting to, to give her a, a wine of her own. And by Bernard, I assume, I think everybody knows you're referring to Bernard Porte, your original winemaker, right? Yeah, I, I should have prefaced that. So uh, Bernard Porte met my grandparents in Bordeaux in, I think it would have been 1969. And at the time, my grandfather was keen on getting into uh, winemaking in Bordeaux. My grandfather's family from his mother's side had been in the wine merchant business for a long time. And so he had spent a lot of time growing up around Bordeaux. And anyways, he met Bernard and he was eager to pursue both opportunities in Bordeaux and outside. And I think that's really where they formed a strong connection was this propensity and desire to seek adventure. Tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get here? I got here through, really through my blood, since it's a family business. But my career has not been in wine. I spent the beginning of my career as a young adult in the shellfish aquaculture space. So fish farming, but shellfish farming predominantly. I have a family interest in a, in a shellfish business in Europe that I've been closely involved with since 2016. But I worked for a number of years for a, a company outside of Boston on the South Shore of Massachusetts in oyster and clam hatchery and farming production management. As I understand it, you became the head of wine making or wine growing, excuse me, and chairman of the board here at Clodeval in 2018. Is that right? I moved out here in end of 2018 and then took on the role as chairman, I guess it would have been January 19, and then took on a, a more direct operating role in the beginning of 2021. And that's really focused around what we've defined as wine growing. I manage the wine growing team, not because I'm technically literate, but that's where, one, I felt the most comfort and up to speed in terms of understanding the business process. My background in production management, obviously in a different industry, but has a lot of similarities into the way you think about bringing a product to market and the, the growing cycle. And so to me, is it is the core of this business. And so I wanted to be very hands on that side. And you have two other siblings, is that right? Yeah. So I have an, uh, an older brother and a younger sister. And then I have three first cousins who are all, they're three sisters. And the six of us make up the ownership group today, along with my grandfather has held on to a very small share and uh, his two sons, so my dad and my uncle. I'd say 95% of the ownership sits with the third generation today. Are there other people in your family who have an active role in the management or the operation of the business? Not here today, no. We've gone a bit, I would say, almost full circle. When I got out here in 2018, I think my family had struggled a bit with, which I think is, is natural when you have generational change in ownership. There was a distancing that was happening between management and ownership here at Clodeval. And so my generation took a, a view, which was if we're going to be engaged as owners, we need to not only understand, but really be involved in the process and really helping set the vision of the business and the strategic path and ensuring that there was good alignment between the ownership and the management. And so there was a brief time where we were quite heavily engaged at the board level. So we had a number of family members. But now that we've set, I think, the right course for for the business going forward, it was really important to ensure that we had the right skill set and capabilities with us. And so that has evolved into having more independent players, both at management and at the board level. Yeah, I referred to earlier that this was your 50th anniversary. And I know when we first talked about the podcast, you were... You wanted to focus more on the future rather than the last 50 years. And I and you referred to Bernard Porte earlier, obviously a big part of your history. And as I understand, it, at least for some period of time, had retired and kind of moved on to try to look at some other businesses of his own, but now is back in a, I think, director of winemaking capacity. How did that come about? And what other changes have you guys made to try to position yourself for the future? Great question. One of the major benefits that we have... There are a number, but not many here in Napa, or really in California, that have a, a long legacy. It's very hard to bring to life brands today in a very, I would say, very um, competitive market. Uh, but we were sitting on 50 years of, of knowledge and history. And so for myself and my family, it was actually critically important that we held on really tightly to 
what we believed the identity of Clodovel was. That was one of the things that I saw when I got here, we were drifting away from. And I think it's so important to one, just to be authentic and be true to who you are, because that actually will translate into a, into a real tangible story and relationship to consumers that they can actually latch on to. And I just think it's, it's better to be honest than feign or pretend to be something else. So Bernard Porte is actually was a really important piece to that, I'd say, re- sort of evolution going forward. And so it was really important to get him back involved because he, for all the right w- reasons, has been the, the sole keeper of this, of this winery and this brand. From an identity searching standpoint, he just he, he had to be involved was was my view and everyone agreed with that. And so it starts obviously with the product and the philosophy, the style, the approach to winemaking and who we are as a wine and who better to help bring that back to life than Bernard. So he joined us on our board of directors. He was very involved in a winemaking search. He was very involved in a viticulture search because those two things working together is what's going to bring the product to life. It was all just anchored around ensuring that we were re- uh, refastening that link to the past to help drive our position as a brand and as a winery for the future. And so it was a bit of a look back to go forward. And, and you have a relatively new winemaker, correct? Tell us a little about her. Yeah. So our winemaker, Carmel Greenberg, this will be her second harvest here. Uh, so the 2022 harvest, she joined us in May of 21. So she caught the whole harvest cycle, but wasn't part of, I would say, the beginning, which is this time of year. This, the moment harvest ends, you're already planning for the next cycle. But she, she's she been in the wine industry now, I think, for about 12 years. So slightly later start to, to getting into that career, I think she was originally went to university for interior design, uh, but got passionate about wine when she was working in a uh, high-end restaurant in Tel Aviv, which is where she grew up in Israel. And that just morphed into, I think I need to pursue this because I have a real interest in wine. And so she left, came to the U.S., got her degree at UC Davis, and then spent time at a number of different wineries in Napa. I'd say the most formative of her experience has been the last five years before joining us. She was the assistant winemaker at Dominus. You know, through the interview process, it was really important that we identified an individual who shared, ideally shared a similar philosophy to winemaking that we do. And someone who really is excited about stewarding a program rather than defining the program. Because to me, one of the major benefits that we have is we have 50 years of legacy of a defined style and approach. We need to carry that forward. That's the anchor to our identity in this business is our style of wine. You referred to it, I think, a little bit earlier, and I've I've read a little bit about it in some other places that kind of in the late 90s, early 2000s, the winery had maybe kind of lost its way a little bit. And one of the things you guys have done is try to really focus on the future and do some other things. I know you've done some things with some of your vineyards and trying to focus more on your Cabernet program. Tell us a little bit about how that came about. The original adventure was to identify a place where Bernard Porte and my grandfather felt they could make the highest quality Bordeaux varietal wines outside of Bordeaux. That was the brief. And that's what they started out doing. And that's why they selected a site that is now what we know as Stag's Leap District. But they very quickly drove to the next adventure. And my grandfather wanted to pursue the next wine that they could make. And so by the mid 80s, they had ventured into making Burgundian style wines. And they had acquired a property on the south side of Napa and started producing Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. The decision was to do it under the same brand, the same umbrella. This is a a brand that now has some market recognition and we should keep feeding it with more products, more SKUs, different varietals. I think at the time in the 80s, they kind of got away with it. It was still a very much a, a young industry here in the U.S. And so there was a lot less competition. As I fast forward then into the 90s and 2000s, I think there was a desire as the industry became more mature, which I think is a natural evolution when that occurs, you get more consolidation. There's a lot of a lot more entrance into the into the space and it became a more cluttered environment. And focus on a brand since then, I just has, I think has required increasing importance for brands because it's very difficult to be a lot of things to someone. 
I think that it's really important to focus on what you can be exceptional at and then be really good at that. And that's what you'll be known for. And so the beginning of losing our way, I think in part was not just anchoring around the, the original vision and what brought the Clote Val brand to life, which was Bordeaux inspired red wines. So a lot of what we've been working on is just actually getting back to those basics, focusing in on what we know we can do exceptionally well, which is making you know, Cabernet based Bordeaux inspired wines from our vineyards here in Napa. And so we've gone through some some decisions on asset divestments, really just to provide clarity as an organization as to what our intent is and allows us to be a little bit more nimble and focused. And so the Clote Val brand today, as we see it, has gone from offering seven or eight different SKUs in the, in the broad market down to two, a Napa Valley Cabernet Sauvignon and a uh, Stag's Leap Red Wine, which is the Yetalil we have in front of you. I know from obviously experience that a lot of people, one of the biggest challenges is finding ways to market your wines, distribute your wines, and get them out there to the people who are interested in buying them. What have you done to kind of change the way you've done things, if you have done anything, on that front? We've taken an approach which may go slightly against the grain, to the industry today, especially wineries of our size, being a, a smaller player in the fine wine space, which is where we've made a firm decision that we are a wholesale first business. If you look purely at the macro stats, you may scratch your head because direct to consumer is obviously the highest margin channel you can play in. But in, in our minds, brands are built through the broad market. Real consumer awareness is achieved through having broad distribution and good representation across the U.S. market. Also feel strongly that the adoption of consumers into a more flexible buyer, both you know buying in bricks and mortar and online, is still and will continue to be heavily fueled through third-party platforms, which go through the traditional distribution process. And so we'd like to stay on the forefront of ensuring we're great suppliers for those platforms that are going to have much broader consumer reach we can on our own website or in our tasting room here in Napa because we get great visitation here and and our direct consumer business is really important we want to make sure that we're providing that but that to me creates a nice synergy to a healthy wholesale business so that to me is one thing that we took a big shift on from a from I'd say the prior strategy that was being operated here and then as we think about how do you actually, as you say, market and, and get good penetration in the wholesale world, you know, for us, relationships are really important. So it starts with distribution. So we've worked really hard on the right distribution alignment. That's taken some time. I think, as you know, that it's a state-by-state -state process, but it is critically important. So relationship was, is the first piece, ensuring you've got the right relationship network. And then from there, it's just rather than focusing on how did we do last year and how can we improve from what we did last year, we take a, I think, a more holistic but targeted view, which is where in the broad market can we actually be successful? So what's our viable universe in the market? For each state, there are thousands of on-premise accounts and there are thousands of off-premise accounts. There's only a certain amount that really can actually sell fine wine and can represent and engage with the consumers that are going to buy wines at these price points. And so you have to take a more targeted approach to where you want to play. And then once you've mapped out what that viable universe looks like, it's just about capturing more share over time. And knowing that it may sound aggressive, but when you think about the, the broad opportunity, growing by 50% from where we are today in a year doesn't sound that crazy when it's really only capturing three or 4% of that viable universe. It's interesting. I think that you're uh, obviously a third generation family business. You referred to it earlier. There aren't that many of you left. I can think of the Barrett's at Montalena as potentially one of them. Uh, but most, if you look through the list of the wines that were at the Paris 1976 tasting, most of those who had started off as family businesses, but are no, either no longer around or are no longer family owned. Do you think that the fact that you're family owned makes it easier or does it pose challenges for you in doing the things you need to do and making the changes you think you need to make? I think there's, there's real benefits and then there are also challenges. I think one of the major benefits that I see is 
the relationships actually in the distribution world is also still very much family owned. And being able to sit across from the table with a distributor owner and aligning on how we like to think in terms of decades, I think is a more powerful conversation when they know that the person across the table actually could be sitting there for another 20 years. Uh, whereas when they're working with uh, larger organizations that are more corporate, corporately run in nature, uh, they may be sitting across from two or three different people in the, in the span of 10 years. There's just more turn there for the right reasons as well. There's, uh, from a consumer standpoint, I think absolutely people like to support this, the small guys a lot. And so one of the things about being family owned in general, and there are, there are exceptions to this, and there are some family owned wineries here in Napa and elsewhere that have done incredibly well and are really big businesses, but they're few and far between. And so I think that there's an added benefit of, of that. The challenge really comes down to resources. And that's to me, that's more the size of the business we are than the fact that we're family owned. But that to me was one of the critical reasons why my family pushed for... They didn't push me to come out here. I, I self-elected, but the agreement that if we're going to continue this, we need to be family, not just family owned, but family operated. What, looking forward five, 10 years down into the future, what are your biggest challenges? Where do you think your biggest challenges are and where do you think your biggest opportunities are? Climate is certainly a challenge. Everyone who's in the, in the ag world will agree with that. And honestly, every, everyone who's living on this planet, I think, recognizes that that's a challenge we're all facing. But it is something that we tackle head on in our business here. And every, every vintage, you naturally will have variation. But I think what we're seeing now is we're having higher volatility in, in, in those variations. And so how do you plan in the beginning stages of a redevelopment plan for our 120 acres here in Stag's Leap? You have to take a, you know, a 35 year snapshot into what you think the curve is going to look like 35 years from now. Because if we do the right things in our development, we should be still getting benefit from that investment 35 years from now. And we know that where we are today from a climatic standpoint is very different from where we were 35 years ago. That's a challenge, but I also see that as it's a, challenges are also opportunities, right? And so it's forcing us to think deeper about what good really looks like. And then just having conviction on, on some bets. So to me is, you know, maybe shifting slightly the varietals that we want to plant, the layout of our plantings. So those are, that's one key area of challenge. Let me ask you about something there. In term, obviously, water here in California is a huge issue. I remember a year or so ago, I think you guys took out a whole row of magnolia trees lining your drive on the way in. And that was one of the reasons, as I remember what other kinds of things are you guys doing from an environmental standpoint to kind of lower your carbon footprint? It's obviously a selling point, I think, particularly amongst younger consumers. What are you doing along those, along those lines? Water conservation is critically important. We haven't built anything out yet in our plans, but it's something that we have in our sites. It's a much bigger and more invasive project, but it needs to be done. And that's the way that we conserve and recycle the water that we do use here in our facility. So I don't have that fully mapped out yet, but know that that is absolutely something that we need to tackle because I think that eventually that's going to become a, a standard requirement here. And you better, you just might not be a first mover in that. That's one effort we've focused on as we've been adding to some of our infrastructure here, ensuring that we're relying more on renewable energies uh, to support our, our energy use. So our entire uh, production facility today is run off of solar panels. Uh, so our whole facility isn't there yet. That's an objective, but we're not there yet. And then as it relates to viticulture and farming practices and how do we reduce our carbon footprint, one of the, th the major things that we're focusing on is how do we actually get good carbon sequestration and actually get carbon back into our soils and invigorating our little ecosystem through the right farming practices? So I'd say it's a lot of small things. And we don't have, I'd say, a carbon neutral target yet. But that's something that we need to identify and then make that part of our goals uh, because it's just it's the right right thing to do. And I think it's Napa and the wine industry, it has enough of a spotlight that you can actually drive faster change in the ag business by being proactive and being a first mover in these kinds of efforts. 
What is your thinking on kind of certified organic farming or regenerative farming, which is kind of the new the new thing right now? Are you taking steps in the vineyard to try to deal with those things as well? Yeah, I have a maybe a slightly controversial point of view on this, which is I am very hesitant and don't drive to chase a certification. I think it's about understanding and doing what's right for your specific site. That may mean that it's farmed entirely organically, and that's great. And then that will be built into our farm plans, but it's not there to check the box off and get the certification. So there's a lot of organic farming practices that we have built into our our farming practices here. I'm actually reading more and actually, I wouldn't say fully adopted, but and bought into the regenerative movement because I think it focuses on the ecosystem and getting it to homeostasis. That is the right approach to be thinking about how we farm better. Because at the end of the day, we reap the benefits of that site. And so you, sh- you would want that site to be as healthy and vibrant and vigorous as it can be. If there's more push for that, I think you're actually going to see the next generation of farming is actually going to be net positive versus the last number of generations that have actually been net negative in terms of impact to to the specific ecosystems that different farms. Tell us a little bit before we kind of put an end to this, t- tell us a little bit about the 2022 harvest. How'd that go for you? What's it looking like? Um, are you happy with it? 2022. So I, I say this having had four vintages now under my belt, which I mean, compared to others out here, that's nothing. So I'm just, I'm still learning how to crawl a little bit, but a challenging harvest this year. Challenging in that initially the yields took people slightly by surprise. I think we went through a, obviously a very light harvest last year, really drought impact as we've been in, you know, some say five years, some say 20 years uh, of drought here in California. So the expectation was that we were going to have a light year as well continuing that compounding effect. And it actually showed uh, an average to average light potential. Uh, So I think that was an initial surprise. And then some of these heat waves towards the end of the growing season into harvest put a lot of strain on the vines. And I think there's a bit of a mixed bag. I think there's some, at least from our sites, we saw some varieties that struggled more than others. Uh, We saw age struggled a little bit more than, than our younger vines. But I actually just went through a a grading and allocation session with Carmel and Bernard, and the potential is actually really promising. So it was a challenging year, but I think the industry and winemakers, I think they made a lot of good decisions in terms of deciding when to pick, how they may adjust the fruit once it's come in through different approach to their fermentation. And if it came in uh, slightly overripe, maybe slightly less uh, skin contact to avoid too much tannin and, and concentration. I learned this in my years growing oysters. Every year, something's going to throw a curveball at you. Every harvest has its challenges. It's just if you plan for the unexpected, you'll be better prepared for it. You can proactively maneuver around whatever the challenge is thrown your way. So we didn't have the major threats like fire this year that could have put a much bigger curve all our way. Uh, so I think in that sense, we're really lucky. I think everyone's really happy that we went through another year without any major threat from that aspect here in Napa. Healthy challenges that keep us pushing forward and learning. One last question, and that's this. When someone comes to your winery and tastes your wines, what do you want them to take away from their experience here and from your wines? If you could sum it up just in a couple of sentences, what is it? I'd like people to walk away with a casual confidence in themselves. I think they want to walk away with a bit of seduction. I think our wine, the way that it plays with your palate, it has layers of complexity and and freshness and it's enticing and, and slightly seductive in nature. So I think those two things are the ones that come at me first. It's, you know, the Clodeval wine is... It's confidence without arrogance. It grows on your palate. It doesn't kind of force its way onto your palate. And I'd like that to be the the same experience people have here, which is suddenly the time just slipped away and they were well taken care of. It wasn't all frills and and too much fuss, but just a, a really nice afternoon that gives them a little bit of pep in their step as they walk out the door. 
All right. Thank you, Olav. Appreciate your time. Well, that's it for today. I'm Rick Van Duzer with my guest, Olav Gallet from Clodoval Winery. And you've been listening to Uncorked by the Wine Industry Group of Ferrella Brown and Martel. If you have any suggestions for topics you'd like to discuss, please email us at uncorked at fbm.com. That's uncorked at fbm.com. And now it's time to put a cork in it. Uncorked.